originally a Radio 4 documentary called uh, The Reunion, which, which was a series of stuff where they put people back together who'd been involved in something significant in history. And, uh, and I heard it as I had um, Steve Woolley, who was the producer. But interestingly enough, I mean, it, it's, it's, I'd done a film called Faith, which was about the minor strike in Nottinghamshire, about a group of striking women. And he kind of went, they had a bald moment and went, he's the bloke of the striking women. And um, so just then rang up and said, look, do you think, might there be a film in this? And then we, at that point, we, we just went and we found out which of the ladies were still uh, alive and went and met some of the ladies. So, but at, at that, to start with, there was, there was just, there was the radio documentary about the strike. And, and that was the starting point. Uh, well, Girl with Pearl Earring obviously was a book. Um, and the, the kind of significant thing about that was that it was a very, I mean, actually, I read the book before it was published. So it was a, an extremely recent book. It was a book that was very consciously historical. And I met the author, Tracy Chevalier, and talked about her research. And I then rather slightly kind of felt almost like her shadow. I then went around to all the same people that she had talked to um, and did more or less the same research that she had done. And it was incredibly reassuring because you know everything she put in the book was incredibly true and accurate. Uh, it was Debbie's book, um, Touching from Distance. Uh, Debbie, obviously Ian's widow. Uh, a really deep, intense, dark book. Uh, and an original uh, point of view in the fact that it, it was the wife's girlfriend's point of view of the rock star's relationship. And someone had bought the rights, some Americans that weren't big producers, and they had a script out, the first script that they had they didn't like. It was written by an American and apparently a big Joy Division fan. And they, by fluke, wanted a, a, a young mank to, to come in and, and, and do it were. again. They didn't even show me the first script. So, you know, it was a case of I just looked at the book and there's just so much great stuff in it. Uh -huh. But I had to turn it on its head to make it Ian's POV because he was the star. You know, if you go to interview somebody, that you go with certain questions in mind, and actually it is always the stuff in between the questions you ask that you know I find that you say, oh, that's interesting. But also that, from the point of view of the interviewee, very often I think that you know you go down and you, they know it's about the, the Ford stri strike of 1968, so they've dredged all their memories up about that. Mm -hmm. and, and very often it, you do need to go, you need to spend a lot of time with people for them to. A to come to trust you, but just also so that the stuff, the stuff sort of filters through as they revisit it, and and then they, they then start turning the incidental stuff, which again is is the is the real, re, the really kind of nice stuff. You know, there's lots of people wanting to put um, their story across, uh, and because it was my first feature, I was really eager to hear as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Too eager, because by the end, I was getting people were recording me. So we were sitting down and, and I was this roadie suddenly brought out a tape recorder and started recording me and I said, what are you doing that for? He says, well, I'm writing my own book. So I want all this down. And so yeah, I was getting some really paranoid, freaky people. <laughs> <laughs> Waking me freak out because I'm thinking, if I don't get all these people's point of views, then it's going to be crap. And, but at the end, it was Tony Wilson who just said, you know, <laughs> just go off and write what you think because you get the basic setup of the characters and at the end of the day you have to own those characters in order to progress but it was it, it took control for me to learn that I think there's ha you have to have this kind of balance between when you start off between finding the story finding out enough to be sure that the story you're telling is kind of the story that you want to tell and not knowing not doing so much research and as you're kind of getting lost in all those different points of view and it's I think it's quite a difficult yeah balance to get right and I know I've kind of gone both ways I thought oh that's the story and gone quite a long way down a story and then sort of found that actually there were too many conflicting things and had to kind of back off and mm -hmm. you know revise what I thought was going on um, and then but I've also done the other thing which is to get you know 500 different points of view and then you can't tell a story at all because yeah, you're yeah. so kind of snow blind with it all like when I did uh did, did uh, Women in Love, and you, you kind of, you know, what you go back to then in terms of research is, and this is where the internet's really dangerous, because, you know, you type D.H. Lawrence, you know, if you, I'll read a couple of critical essays on Lawrence, and, you know, this, you read this thing, and it, you think you're reading a real expert, and it's some berserker sitting in his underpants in Texas, you know, and, 
and you kind of think to yourself, and, and that you can just get a real overload then because yeah. it's, you know, you're moving back each time. And interestingly, the, and I don't know if you found, you know, if you found this, you know, because I'd never worked on a novel before, but, but for me, the, the, the process there was to just kind of research the circumstances in which it was written and then just to try and get away from mm. all of that other interpretation around the, the other writer that you're going through. Just to leave it as clean as possible, but that was that was hard because there was so you know so much out there. I feel that my research, the kind of rhythm of it, has changed slightly because I used to have a period when I went to the British Library or I went to the Collindale to the newspaper library, or, you know, and I had to dedicate three days to reading all that material, and I'd have to book, you know, you used to have to go and book your seat in the newspaper library and book up, you know, I'd like to have 1888 to 1893, please. And so you absolutely had to go and do all that and take the notes and make the photocopies and, you know, and then you had done that bit of research. Whereas now, you know, I can go, hmm, I can't quite remember, you know, what did happen in 1893? Oh, New York Times, thank you very much, you know. And it's, so you don't have to kind of choose, you can do it more, more as you're going along. And I found that has been really helpful because rather than having a lump of research and then sort of forgetting half of it and... Yeah you know, trying to write and then thinking, oh, I must go back and look at the research again. I can actually look for things when I need them and when they come up in the story and you think, oh, I really actually, uh, you know, when they say driving a four in hand, I've just been doing a thing with lots of carriages in it. <laughs> so I, you suddenly realize you need to know what different carriages are because it's going to make a difference to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you can immediately find, you know, the wonderful person who has a complete online museum of yeah. every carriage that was ever invented, God bless him. Well, I think the internet is fantastic, I really do, <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, you know, I'm just doing this thing about Paul Raymond and I've just been able to get everything, you know, all the articles that have ever been written about him, just at the, you know, the press of the book. Yeah. And you've got them there in print out. And I think maybe, you know, it depends on what kind of genre you're writing in with the internet. When you're researching, you've got to spend money time researching, actually reading the stuff that you print out. You can spend all day putting your credit card into things, buying books, and not have done anything all day. Really, that, that's, that's the worst thing. It's one big tip is when you're researching, read what you're researching. But I think in general, no, I think it, it's what, it, to me, you can spend hours on it, and, but at the, at the same time, I like going into that world, where, right. whether it's actually, you know, I use it in the end or not. Mm -hmm. I think I'm constantly educating myself. I've just done something about rowing, and I thought, well, I've, I've never rowed in my life. So I rang up the University 8. I said, can I come down and have a row with you? Never again. And, um, <laughs> but what's really interesting, I've quite got into it now, actually, which I say never again. And, uh, and I thought to myself, this is really interesting because I just actually, you know, you're writing a scene, and I actually know what it feels like now when you go blind because mm. you can't breathe and you're going to be sick and all the rest of it. And so there are times where it's actually quite useful just to, it's not to do with, you know, that how that all fits in there or anything like that, but actually that you've, and that I've, I know how to work a machine. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can, if you need a car seat knocking up, I'm your man. <laughs> and um, so little things like that, just to know it for how your fingers feel yeah. at the end of the day. And, just, and I, I sometimes, and I, at times when I was doing that, I thought, well, it's just an excuse to go and have a row and play on it. But at the same time, it's, that isn't interesting how that can sometimes feed through as well. And I think that's a kind of, in a way, that's a different, it's almost like psycho, sort of like a psychological, emotional research. But I do think that is really, really useful. When I went to Mendips and, you know, we got, we got a special tour on there, I just knew that I was, I was doing the most amazing job in the world because, <laughs> I, you know, you're in John Lennon's room. Well, as soon as you start seeing the real places and you do the, I mean, that, that to me is, you start infusing yourself with, with things that really aren't tangible. You know, you, you really start creating from inside. inside. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I did the walk from John's house to Paul's house, the, which they used to do, and you just suddenly start becoming John Lennon. It's great. <laughs> and I think going to the locations, and, and I always put pictures up in the, in the office as well. I walk in and it's like a, a gallery of what the film is about, of, of, of people and of places. And, uh, it's just so important, really, really important, just to get a feel of, of what the place looks like. True stories are very unwieldy and undramatic and lots of stuff happens and, you know, it's not really going to work as a story. So at some point you're going to have to make decisions about simplifying things, about amalgamating characters or creating a fictional character instead of the 
real ones. Um, you're going to have to change things in the, the order of events, or you're going to have to squeeze, you know, things will have to be changed in order to make it a dramatically viable story. Um, so then you have to make this, you know, I think what writers always say grandly is, well, the spirit of it is true, you know. And <laughs> I wrote, you know, in, in a sense of a kind of greater, higher truth, which was the dramatic truth. But actually, we just want to tell a good story. At the end of the day, you know, stories, stories got to be king, I think, because it's a form of entertainment. And, you know, you, and sometimes you, you've got to make it work for the, for the audience rather than work, work for the sort of fact finder. And there are times where you're talking about a completely fictitious scene, but you're still going, I know they would not Absolutely. have done that. Yeah. And then it becomes, but you've got to have, you know, you've got to believe that because otherwise, you know, you, feel, I think films and, and, and TV programs and stuff, they, the ones that really work are the ones that have just got a strong, strong taste, you know, and it means some people won't like them, but, but, but it's because, and they've got a strong taste because they, the, the fewer people involved in putting that character on, the, the, few, the fewer people involved in creating the truth of the world or the truth of the character, the better. And the more you're having to kind of water things down for other people's finances or whatever, it just, it, it just you know, that thing about too many chefs, well, it's absolutely right. It does start to taste a bit insipid.